Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to Unique Ways with Thomas Gerard, an audio podcast. I had a really great guest on today. He's a UK-based design, craft, and architecture writer and podcaster whose work has been published in The Observer, New Statesman, The Guardian, Daily Telegraph, Frame, Dwell, House and Garden, and quite a few others. Please join me in welcoming Grant Gibson. Welcome. Hi, Thomas. How are you? Good. Are you ready for 20 questions? Well, I don't know. Let's give it a go, shall we? Okay. Question one. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. What do you do? Well, I mean, you kind of summed it up quite neatly. I um, have been a design journalist and I guess commentator since sometime in the mid-90s, um, editing magazines. I started on a magazine. They're all UK-based magazines. I started on a magazine called FX, um, edited a magazine called Blueprint for four years, around 2000. Did a short spell on the RABA Journal, edited a magazine called Crafts, um, which was all about making things. And then five years ago, I started a podcast called Material Matters with Grant Gibson. Um, in each episode, I talked to a maker, designer, artist, artist, architect about a material or technique with which they're intrinsically linked um, and discovered how it changed their lives and careers. And then a couple of years ago, that turned into a fairly significant fair um, in a place called Barge House, which is in Southwark in London during the London Design Festival. Awesome. And just to know for our audience, if you guys are looking for podcast or episodes, definitely check out the one with Debbie Millman. That was an early episode. Um, so question two, what's a key piece of knowledge that makes you different? Um, yeah, key piece of knowledge. I mean, as I just said, I'm a I'm a journalist by inclination, um, rather than by training necessarily, because I actually got a degree in history. I mean, journalists tend to be intellectual pond skaters. Um, so I guess my knowledge is broad but shallow, um, which makes me quite a good guest at a dinner party or down the pub. So a single piece of key knowledge, not sure I have one. I guess if I have anything, it's a kind of spread of knowledge. Great. And question three, why this of all things? Why do you do what you do? Um, well, I mean, the podcast really was because people stopped buying magazines. Um, I always wanted to be a journalist ever since I was about 13 or 14. I uh, launched an alternative magazine at school, worked an alternative magazine at university, just wanted to make magazines. Um, and I did for a very long time. And then people stopped reading them. So I had to reinvent myself. Um, when I finished at my last magazine, which was Crafts, I kind of got essentially if you're editing magazines, paper magazines nowadays, you're essentially editing, you're managing decline. And I got fed up of that. Um, so I wanted to create something that was bigger than me. So a brand, but I had to do that on a budget. And podcasting seemed quite an effective way of doing that. Um, and I have to say, I mean, obviously, as you point out, you've had Debbie Millman on the show, and she's been doing it for many, many years. When I started five years ago in the UK, um, there really weren't many podcasts out there. And there certainly weren't many design British design podcasts out there. So it was quite a step into the dark. Um, and um, I did it without any great expectations. But the first six shows I put out did terribly well. So it gave me a, a sense that this could actually work and be something bigger than just a podcast. Great. And some people struggle with number four. But the question is, what does your future look like? Sorry, Thomas, you you. You cut out for a moment. Um, the question is, what does your future look like? Oh, gosh, my future or the future in general? I mean, my future, <laughs> I hope, <clears throat> it's pretty rosy. We have a, in the immediate future, I'm recording a new series of the podcast. We have the third uh, edition of The Fair coming out this September, 18th to 21st. We're looking to take it abroad. Um. Yeah, I'm kind of, we have a brand that we're trying to do something with. When I say we, I have a business partner nowadays, um, William Knight, who used to be the deputy director of the London Design Festival back in the day and is a design events expert. Um, so I lean very heavily on his knowledge for the fair and live events that we're doing and have planned in the future. Great. And five we say is unique to this show. The question is, let's talk about location. How does the notion of place play into what you do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
I guess with the podcast, I mean, I've interviewed people from or working in China, in Mexico, in the US, in Europe. So in some regards, place doesn't feel that important. That said, um, I've had a long term love affair with London. Um, I grew up in a place called Essex, which is in the countryside, about three quarters of a, an hour down the tracks from Liverpool Street, one of the major stations in London. And as I was growing up as a child, I was always looking at these incredibly exciting things that seemed to be going on in the city, which was close, but tantalizingly a bit too far away at mm. that age and always wanted to get there and, and see what was happening, um, which I've spent, you know, a large portion of my life doing and, and working within. So I think London has played an incredibly important part in my career. I remember when we were doing the, um, we were launching the fair, I was interviewed by an Indian website called Stir. And they said to me, well, why did you decide to launch it in London? And it took me back a little bit, if I'm honest, because I just like, well, where else would I do that? I'm a Londoner, basically. That's that's where where else could I have launched this show? So London has played a very important part um, in my life and career. And actually growing up outside it, and for various reasons, I'm back in Essex at the moment. Um, kind of growing up outside it has, has led to um, uh, an intense feeling of love for it, which is interesting nice and six if you had to start from the beginning what advice would you give your former younger self um i think i'd say believe in yourself a bit more um i think i can lack a bit of self-confidence i can be uh very self-critical i am very self-critical and uh maybe you know i'd ask myself to give myself a break occasionally i guess that would be the uh the top piece of advice i'd give myself Great, and what's a day in your life like? Um, well, it varies. I mean, today I've uh, been sat at a desk um, researching a podcast that I'm doing tomorrow morning and writing all the questions and coming up with the intro. Um, I mean, whereas yesterday I was in London, I had a meeting with a PR agency, um, I did some some work at the Royal Society of Arts, of which I'm a fellow, and then I had an evening function. And I, I do quite a lot of evening functions. Um, I think some of that's a throwback to being a journalist uh, or a different kind of journalist. Um, also, nowadays, doing this fair, I have um, loads of exhibitors. I mean, we, we have 40, 45 exhibitors in the fair every year, and I have quite a paternal uh, feeling towards them and want to see them thrive and do well and if they have openings or they're launching stuff then I want to be there and support them basically so um, I was doing a bit of that last night and uh, also drinking their free champagne which is very good thank you Okio and eight lifelong learning it's a popular topic how do you stay up to date well I do a lot of reading Thomas um, I mean I yeah the job requires a lot of research always has done in that sense because I don't have a design training as I think I mentioned I got a degree in history so in, in that sense my design knowledge has always been kind of autodidactic if you like um, and that continues to this day so if I'm researching somebody or I've got a topic I need to to get into then it's a it's a lot of research and a lot of reading of a lot of books so I'll probably get through for a series of the podcast I'll do three or four books generally because also the other thing with the podcast, it's nice to have a journalistic hook and a reason to do it. And one of the best hooks is if somebody's written a book um, and if somebody's written a book, you have to have read the book if you're going to interview them in any depth. So, um, yeah, a lot of research and a lot of reading goes on. Great and a lot of going to shows and seeing stuff. And that's the other thing, because you actually have to go and see a lot of things to reject or not feel it's quite the right time to get them on the show. So you wade through an awful lot of information. Great. And nine is around tools. Um, do you use both digital and analog tools? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not very techy. You know, I've got a MacBook Air and I'm talking through a microphone with a pair of headphones at the moment. Um, I'm, you know, I, I use a pen and a notebook quite often. I'm terrible on spreadsheets. My business partner loves a spreadsheet. And he's much better at them than I, than I and, and kind of gets really frustrated with my um, lack of love for Google hard drives or whatever they are somewhere in the sky. So, I, I you know, I use tech when I have to. Um, 
which is a lot, but I'm I'm no expert. Great. And work-life balance or life-work balance? How do you yeah. it? Well, I don't. <laughs> it's a short answer. Um, I, uh, you know, we're a startup. I mean, the pod's been going five years, but we had the pandemic in between that. So in a curious kind of way, although we found an, an audience when the, the pandemic was happening, um, because everybody was stuck at home, had nothing to do and discovered these things called podcasts, at least they did in the UK. Again, I think the the market in the US is slightly different. Um, so yeah, we're, I, we're a startup. I am working, I'm working probably hard to get this thing off the ground and running and it's um it's beginning to bear fruit which is great and when it bears fruit then i'll think about a work-life balance nice and 11 if you weren't doing what you do now what might you be doing uh well i always wanted to be a professional cricketer thomas do you i mean do you know cricket is that a thing that's reached um your short wait well, has reached your shores i don't know if it's reached you um it's, it's quite an english kind of Empire. The only people that play it are some of the nations in, in the empire. But I'm very fond of cricket, um, and wanted to be a professional cricketer. Uh, played at a reasonable level, um, but realised when I was quite young that I wasn't going to cut it. I did play with a guy who went on to open the batting for England and is now a TV cricket kind of commentator. And he was so obviously so much better that it, you know that was never going to happen. Um, and I worked that out by about the age of 13. And then I thought, well, I'd write about cricket instead, which, you know, the, being the um, cricket correspondent for The Guardian uh, was always high on the list of things to do. Um, trouble is, cricket tours tend to be quite bright and they can write pretty well themselves. So so that got knocked out of the, um, the equation. I did a lot of acting at university and toyed with the idea of becoming a director, um, but journalism... Um, kind of took over so um, I'm kind of doing what I always wanted to do really it's one of those things I you know I quite enjoy it great and what would you not like to do with your career um well I'm happy I'm happy that I you know I don't I have huge admiration for people who go and mine coal um I you know I wouldn't fancy that I wouldn't fancy working in a sweatshop making cheap fashion that t-shirts that people that that wear six times and throw them away i mean there's all sorts of things i wouldn't want to do um so and i'm glad i don't have to do them um and yeah favorite word quote or sentence uh favorite word quote or sentence so i got uh a message on instagram um a few weeks ago from mark in australia who runs a company called manor furniture and he wrote me this very funny note. I wasn't sleeping. And I think there's a question about sleeping later on, which I'm quite looking forward to. But for various reasons, I wasn't sleeping. This message came in at five o'clock in the morning. And um, it was it was a hooty. Basically said, I've, I've binged listened to all your podcasts and I've developed a drinking game based around it. Um, and apparently, well, every time I interviewed somebody who'd been to the Royal College of Art, um, he had to have a drink, and that's yeah, relatively regularly. There's quite a few ex um, students from the Royal College get on the show, but every time I use the word damazain, um, he had to have a drink as well. I think he must have been quite drunk by the time he he messaged me, Thomas. Um, so damazain would appear to be a word of which I'm very very fond. I love it. And how about a least favorite word quote or sentence? Well, yes, quotes. Quotes are often about context, aren't they? Um, so there's a quote. When I was, I was about, where old would I have been? Eight in 1979, when in the UK, um, we elected a, a politician and prime minister called Margaret Thatcher. And on the steps of Downing Street, she quoted, a, well, a kind of poem, I guess, that is often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. And she said, where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. And, I mean, it just struck me as, I mean, I was eight at the time, but watching it since, no, I think I was probably vaguely aware. Um, I mean, she did, she did, for a large proportion of the British population, she did exactly none of that and set elements of British society against each other in a way that was really unconscionable. So um, that's always a quote that um, reminds me of her.
and irritates me. Nice, and 15, you're choosing one word to describe yourself. What word would it be? Um, should we go for stubborn, Thomas? Great. I mean, I could, there are others. Contrarian might help. I, I think I inventive occasionally. That's two words. There's lots of words. Let, stubborn. Let's go there. 16, what keeps you up at night? Um, uh, well, some things I'm not going to tell you about, quite frankly. But, um, I mean, I do, I am a worrier. I mean, that, that dovetails with the self-criticism thing that we were talking about. Um, so... You know, I can spend a lot of time at night thinking about work. I'm also quite inventive at night. I have some of my better ideas because I do go back and forth um, mentally. Um, I come from a family of insomniacs, um, so I can go protracted lengths of time without sleep, and it doesn't seem to affect me too much. Um, so, yeah, it's elements of work and coming up with ideas often keep me awake at night, but not in a bad way. I'm I'm kind of all right with it most of the time. Do you have a dream you're chasing? Uh, well, it's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? I mean, you know, I have two children, uh, 21 and 19. And, you know, you just want them to be healthy and happy, really. A filthy rich would be nice too, but mainly healthy and happy. Last few here. What inspires you? Um, People, largely. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, doing the show... But well, being a journalist, fundamentally, you get to meet loads of fascinating people with fascinating stories who have lived extraordinary lives. And you get to either record them or jot down what they've said and then write about it. And it's it's a tremendous privilege. Um, yeah, so that 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 inspires me. The other thing that inspires me, and I don't think people talk about this enough, actually, is I do just ins I'm inspired by people who do a good job. Um, when I was a, like a student in my early 20s, I remember there was a British um, TV and radio presenter who was going through a, a moment of uh, huge fame, like his 15 minutes of, of fame, where he was being interviewed by everybody and he had the biggest show on British TV or, or a big show anyway. And he was asked um, what he admired. And he said, I just admire people that do the job. And as a student at that time, having not been in the workplace properly, I didn't really know what he meant. And it was only when I got in the workplace and realized that actually there are loads of people out there who aren't really doing a brilliant job. They're kind of getting by and they're bullshitting a bit that you realize it's the people who are good. You cling on to them. And so I'm inspired by people who do a good job. Great. And last couple here, any advice you'd like to share? Um. Oh, well, I suppose be pleasant to people because you never know um particularly junior members of staff i mean this is another slightly odd quirky british story i suppose there's we've got a, a band called take that who were a huge boy band in the 90s early 90s and they were renowned for being delightful to work with professional um courteous to all the research staff and the junior people they're working with on tv shows and then they came back and became a they disappeared they broke up um and then they came back as a like a man band about probably about i don't know 20 years ago and all the junior researchers that they'd been pleasant to a decade or more before they were the, they were now tv producers and they were delighted to work with take that as soon as take that came back they said yes we will work with them and i don't think there's something to learn in that i think i think be nice to to people because you never know where you're going to end up and what you're going to need from them so yeah Great. And finally, number 20, how can our listeners keep tabs on you and what's our call to action? Uh, you can keep tabs on me quite easily, Thomas. I'm at uh, materials, material.matters underscore grant.gibson, which is a bit of a mouthful, I grant you. Um, the Material Matters uh, also has an Instagram, which is materialmatters.design. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, Material Matters also has a website, which again is materialmatters.design. You can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all over. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm pretty hard to avoid, actually, increasingly on the Internet. OK, well, thanks so much for joining today. You know, really inspiring to hear your origins of your podcast uh, story and journey um, and very much enjoyed this. Thanks. That was my pleasure, Thomas. Thank you very much.